Return to Biblical Marriage The Bible expresses the God view of Himself and His creation, and all men, without exception, are an expression of these views, mostly in the form of conduct and prose. The immediate conclusion is, what am I talking about? Doesn't the Bible condemn and reform and exhort us to a more godlike living? Yes. And these are in accord, I'd say. All know the requirements of God from us, especially in the conscience's work, and specifically in the area of relationships for chief amongst the exhortations of the Bible is a return to God, renewal of the broken relationship, and the fundamental analogy. Marriage, akin to Christ and his church, see Ephesians 5, 31, hence the theme of marriage for this discuss. It may appear disjointed, but I hope the relevance and cohesiveness of these subparts would be visible to all who lend me their ears. This affects all of us in a measure. We are mostly naive in fostering relationships, unless of course we heed guidance and are schooled in scriptures, mighty in prayer and supplication for, then shall we prevail though we are observant. Our conclusion are somewhat overlooking of the severity of those little nuances we notice, see 1 Corinthians 7 25, 40. When we analyze relationships in our day and firstly conclude that there is indeed no fear of God before the eyes of men in general and relationships in particular as many have made their own rules around this. There are some things I would like to highlight per adventure. We may be brought to the right view of relationship with God through a bird's eye view of the state of relationships with men made in God's image yet so far away from him as expressed in our relationship views. I could take a specific part of the Bible to speak on, but I hope you would forgive this rather scurrying and disjointed approach. Love is strong, therefore breaking it is not love. The love between Christians should reflect in some measure that of Christ and His Church. Unbreakable, bending, fractious, grieving but not breaking. See Ephesians 5.25 The worldlings, well, they haven't the spirit therefore are open to folly. My approach is to align this with the stages of relationship, highlighting the warnings, biblical views and perspective, the omissions and how to return. This will always take the form of repentance as a stranger to or backslider from the kingdom of Christ within the particular context. So to begin the courtship stage of relationships involves an expression of love towards each other regardless of how this manifests. Some say love blossoms over time, others that it is like being hit by a truck. Suddenly, kind of the same view expressed with being saved and seeing being saved is the cessation of relationship with one order and commencement of relationship with another. And there are some in between these extremes. Yes, love if acquired and expressed, though even at this early stage we can begin to see cracks. There are feelings that are confused with love, lust, a strong desire for a partner, societal pressures, love, but not of the person, of other things associated like wealth, status, physique, culture, refinement, and education. Just to mention a few, see 1 John 2.16. Some advocate how to detect these, mostly by what is said speech or action, which as you know is said to speak louder than voice, looking at the person's comfort zones, who they interact with, what they find most fascinating or enthralling, whether they are restless or settled, are they bold to display disrespect at that early stage, expressing strong tendencies toward unfaithfulness, and the list is a long one. It is remarkable how these bear a striking resemblance to our relationship with God. Our associations, conduct, frequency, as in where we visit frequently, fleeting moments of pleasure as we dart from one pleasure habit to the next, and mostly our refusal to seek advice from those senior, in this case, Christ see Romans 1, and his word, or do we think he doesn't tell us what we need to know, do and not to do about courtship? What about Isaac? See Genesis 24, 43, Jacob see Genesis 29, 18, 20, David see 1 Samuel 18, 20, Moses see Exodus 2, 15, 21, Peter see Mark 1, 29, minus 31, John see John 19, 27, Samson, see Judges 14, 1, 2, and many more. The Bible expressly tells us about God's rule over all our lives. Especially, courtship cannot come from void, and we ignore these warnings and guidelines to our peril and heartache in our latter years. Remember, Christ is the Ancient of Days whose hair is white as wool, a symbol of wisdom, see Revelation 1, 14, 
So in courtship, we learn from and pray to Him and watch unto prayer if that relationship is to be or not. If in youth we are like a seed and full-blown when aged, what we saw in our youth will only blow out. A leopard does not change his spots, see Jeremiah 13.38. If in youth we are not domesticated, compassionate, are uncouth, our minds tainted, this will only get worse as we age. What if we are saved? We will explore this topic a little later. It is worth bearing in mind here what Paul said about our ability to handle meat that is the hard to understand parts of the Bible, see 1 Corinthians 3, 2. Another aspect of relationship is the actual crystallization of our love in marriage, a most sacred relationship to all, especially those of the household of faith. The vows we took, see 1 Corinthians 7, 39, I recall my wedding service, the preacher saying, If you divorce, you have to bring all these people who came to witness the marriage. Impossible, he is saying. Some have a light view of marriage, and same goes our view about God's sovereignty, his rule, his absolute detestation of unfaithfulness, see Romans 1. Are you married according to the tenets of love just explained, and do you take it lightly, whereby adultery does not fill you with dread? The Lord has reserved the judgment that makes some of the destitutions and desolations we've read and observe. Child's play compared to what is reserved for the adulterer. I am not saying others' sins get lesser punishment or can be viewed as lesser sin. However, this incurs his swiftest response, for we know God is not hasty in judgment. Now we could misinterpret some scriptures like the woman caught in the very act brought before Christ, see John 8. 4. Or the woman who had relationships with five men, see John 4.18. These are, if you like, akin to courtship, were advised and warned to desist and sin no more, not rather encouraged to continue. The best judgment is that Paul mentioned, of the destruction of the flesh, so the soul be saved, of the Christian who committed adultery with his stepmom see. Corinthians 5.5. 5. Here we see that the man is held to account as the stronger, so let the men be particularly strong here. Women are rebuked too, not just the men. All are accountable before God. Does this encourage us to go ahead because we are still saved? Mark these words. You will feel you've lost your salvation, though you haven't. When this punishment comes, you will cry out like Esau and even for your body, but it will be too late, so please do not take it lightly. Yes, the man was restored to the church, but he was overcome with much sorrows, not to be wished on ourselves. That dreadful disease. Let it not once be named amongst you, sayest the word, see Ephesians 5, 3, telling us it is the most resistible for us with our new nature and means of grace, prayer, supplication, worship, and Lord's table at our disposal for strengthening C. Mark 14, 38. Especially being the sin God hates the most, our nature means we hate it too. To fall easily, to have this as a mindset for any reason, is to cast doubt upon our salvation state. You don't understand, preacher. I have a higher level of hormones. No, you are strengthened, as the exhortation gives no such exception. Today we see a very apostate world, and the hallmark of apostasy is always this sin of unfaithfulness. It has always been, but when the world is wholly apostate, it is the sign therefore we Christians need to tread carefully. See Jude one twenty three. Be not deceived, the heart is evil and desperately wicked, and let that be a warning to you, see Jeremiah 17, 9. You will find a thousand reasons to justify your actions if you let this embroil you. You will fool yourself thinking God will omit to react to this. In severe retribution on earth, Adam and Eve made the same mistake. So did King David see Psalm 51. You may even begin to say, well, Solomon had so many women, and this or the other. Every one of them regretted it, and the Bible is clear about one man, one wife, and that means vice versa. See Ecclesiastes 9, 9, Proverbs 31, 10, 12, Matthew 19, 5. The New Testament exhorts us to this and warns against flouting it, for the believer that is. If you have entertained or contemplate even dare to plan to do this, shows your backslidden state, see Proverbs 14.14, 14, and the thing to do is repent and come out from that place or surrounding that you have thrust yourself whatsoever unwholesome thing you watch or read or the company you keep. Leave immediately.
there are other signs of apostasy, as someone has asked. What do we do about the prevailing corruption in our day, whether financial, racial, nepotism, tribal, cliques, guilds, secret societies, favoritism, and so on? What do we do about the masquerades amongst us who like the woman of Babylon in the book of Revelation 17? 5. Portray false wholesomeness and truth, yet are of corrupt minds and actions. We ourselves refrain from joining their ranks, despite the cost to us. We acquire the best education, that of knowing God and His Word. We worship Him aright in the spirit of holiness, having sought His salvation and contribute, continue to spread His gospel and social benevolent act where we can. So let's consider some positives. Joseph's example is worthy of emulation, and a full discuss is for another study. However, he had every excuse to be bitter or impatient. He was a prophet and had assurance of his leadership. Yet he was thrown into a pit by none other than his brethren, sold to slave merchants, and endured a very arduous long journey to Egypt. Had some reprieve yet when tempted, could have used his suffering as an excuse to falter. But he stood firm and fled the scene with utmost haste. See Genesis 39, 12. The Lord exhorted contentment and godliness for his people. See 1 Timothy 6, 6. And not empty words, for we have the indwelling spirit. Access to the Father through his Son, to cry and pray daily and receive strength sufficient for the day. See Matthew 6, 34. The indwelling spirit is stronger than any temptation, so we are without excuse. We also have a spouse, and God forbid we defraud one another to heighten our susceptibility to temptation and not fulfill our God-given right to consummation of the love we suppose to share. It is a woeful thing. See 1 Corinthians 7, 5. We have renewed reborn souls, though the flesh warreth against the soul, yet the body is weaker, a wretched body that we have, so it must always remain the vanquished in this tussle. See Romans 7, 25. The soul made anew is leaning on Christ, our tower, strength and ever-present help in times of trouble or temptation. See Psalm 46. Let's explore some believers of old to give context and some color to our days. The idea is to try categorize their salvation stages under the headings high, medium, low, indicating stages of salvation and high meaning saved. The aim is to use this as benchmark in categorizing believers in our midst today. Also to show the different duration of salvation some instant over a few days over a few years. This way, we can perceive people better and understand their state, though this cannot be the panacea for deciding categorically who is saved, in the process or unsaved. It includes in a way the ability to handle meat and not be milk handlers only. The blind man healed in stages, see Mark 8.24. He had sight so that classes as medium, then he saw fully meaning high. Now though we are told these transition stages happened within a short time, sometimes Christians, and I say Christians seeing God always finishes what he start, as we saw with the miracle, are in the medium state for a period, years, months possibly. With Job, we weren't told when he believed, but he was tried for a long time, and as far as we can deduce, he was a believer from the beginning of the narrative. See Job 1.20, 22, and during, he professed and depended on God, preaching to his friends, see Job 19.25. But his friends were convinced that he wasn't save or save, and was being punished for some grievous sin he'd committed. He was vindicated in the end, and sometimes some of us are like Job. If judged as by his friends, we come to the same conclusion. With David believed to have been saved in his youth amongst the sheep, and elements having received the Spirit at his anointing, and displayed faith in the Lord, at the slaying of Goliath, he was a soldier and took life, committed adultery for which he paid a huge price, yet some might conclude anyone who takes a life is not a Christian. A penman of scripture, a worthy king and with great hero of faith. With Solomon and his women, some may conclude he isn't saved, yet he was a king had to abide and conduct diplomatic matters according to his day, the wisest man who ever lived except for Christ and exhorted that he would only have one woman had he the opportunity. Having many wives does not mean unbelief thou the norm is one man, one wife, the blissful norm that is. Peter, denied the Lord thrice, sank in the sea due to lack of faith, a practical man, 
and quite slow in his beliefs and recognition of God's authority. See John 21. The descending carpet with all manners of mammals, for example, see Acts 10, 12. Yet he was a stalwart in the early Jerusalem church, part of the bands whose ministry saved 3,000 on that inaugural day of the New Testament church. Slow to understand, as some today does not mean they would not be saved, we have to be patient and relentless in our ministry. Paul lost his sight and only partially regained it all his life, besotting the Lord thrice, see 2 Corinthians 12. 8. Some will say illness or deformity is a sign of unbelief, yet he was most prolific in journeying, writing, prayer and martyrdom. Also the last of the apostles, to see the Lord see 1 Corinthians 15, 8. Some suffer illnesses to deflect them from the world and stay their attention on ministering the Lord Jesus Christ. Barnabas had a huge row with Paul, though also used of the Lord, but not as much as Paul, see Acts 15, 39, vindicating Paul that only those fit should undertake the work of the Lord mentally, ready to take persecution and hardship like our Lord for his sake, see 2 Timothy 4, 11. Just because we have some minor differences in doctrinal matters, not those that concern fundamentals such as docetism, does not mean one side is Christian and the other not. Samson did a piece a while back to highlight the error of his vilifiers, was much troubled in his journey of faith, practically alone as a judge, to fight Israel's battles against the Philistine. Married a worldling, lost his sight, enslaved, but he slew more of the Lord's enemies than some other judges of that era. Because a person marries a worldling and could have done before being saved does not mean he is not the Lord's. Eliezer fought mightily for the Lord and slew his enemies until his hand clave unto the sword. Showing relentlessness and a strong sense of duty and commitment, see 2 Samuel 23, 9, 10. We see a man zealous in witness more than any of his. Her peers does not mean he is a fanatic. He is spreading the word zealously and regardless of personal discomfort. Esther married a king who had a harem, yet she was instrumental in preserving the lineage of Christ. So there are Christian women in household of men who have many wives not saying this is the norm but exception, and we cannot write off the women for this, especially where they are doing their bit for the Lord. So Spurgeon, he spoke, wrote and acted according to his beliefs that Christians should do, his effort to clean up body and soul saw many conversions, so we see his standards and benchmark preachers and church leaders against these. What are their modus operandi? Do they build and preach from the word only, or do they amass wealth and do not preach the gospel, but their own wisdom? We measure all preachers by such yardstick. Calvin, Death, J. Wesley, Departed, were left by their wives, yet they continued to serve and work for the Lord, their writings and achievements are there for all to read. Just because a man's wife leaves him does not make him an unbeliever. The end shall reveal all who really is the Lord's and who isn't. However, the Lord tells us that by their fruits we shall know them. Sometimes we do make haste in assessment or are impartial or are biased nevertheless as per the hymn. Day of judgment, day of wonders indeed. The hymn, day of judgment, day of wonders shall follow.